If you've been around Ontario's capital city for several decades, the name Howard Mosco should ring a bell. Mosco was in municipal politics, first on North York Council, then Metro Toronto Council, and finally the Mega City Council from 1978 to 2010. To some, he was a whistleblower who chafed at arbitrary authority and looked out for the little guy. To others, he was a big-time pain in the you-know-what. He's put together a hundred of his best stories in a new memoir entitled Call Me Pisher, a madcap romp through City Hall, and it brings the Pisher, Howard Mosco, to our studios. How you doing? I'm, I've never been older. <laughs> I, guess, I guess that is true. Howard, what's a Pisher? A Pisher is a little squirt. Uh, when my father and I used to argue, and he, he, I didn't like what he said, he would say, so you'll call me Pisher. It's, uh, it's a, up, the equivalent of an upraised middle finger. <laughs> and somehow that became your nickname. To well, your father over the years. Uh, yeah, it's kind of an act of defiance. You an know? act of, well, that, that suits you. Here's, this is from page three in the book, so you make the case right off the top. My grandfather was a horse thief, my grandmother a bootlegger, my father a bookmaker, and my brother a scalper. So there was nothing left for me but politics. Now, that's a funny story, but I also happen to know it's not true. You went into politics because your mom took you to City Hall and introduced you to stuff. Tell me about that visit. Uh, I was immediately awed, uh, especially at the council chamber. Uh, I looked at this big football-like petition at the, at the top, and I, I wondered what goes on behind that petition, and I just somehow had to find out. How old were you? I, about uh, 12, 12, 13. And you think the seed was planted right then and there? Oh, the seed was planted before that, because I really became interested. I used to go to the Ontario legislature, uh, and sit in the balcony hoping to hear Joe Salzburg speak, who was our member of parliament. He was the only communist ever elected to the, yeah. uh, the legislature, and he was articulate in a couple of languages. Hmm. When you first got elected, the North York Traffic Commissioner, Sid Cole, apparently said to you, politicians come and go, but I'll be here a lot longer than you, so play ball with me and we'll get along. Yeah, Sid was wrong. <laughs> you didn't take his advice, eh? Uh, I, well, I didn't play ball, and I <laughs> happened to be there longer than he was. <laughs> <laughs> you did last longer than him, didn't you? 32 years. My goodness, that's a good run. Once upon a time, we're going to go through some of the stories sure. in the book here, obviously. Once upon a time, they used to spray the grass, I gather, in North York with a chemical 2,4-D, and people got sick. You eventually got that banned by challenging a fellow councillor to drink it. What happened? Well, I knew that uh, Yule, 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 who was uh, the, the councillor, was opposed to this. He, he, he said in committee, in committee uh, uh, a salesman once told me, you can even drink a glass of this stuff. So I was ready for that line. So when Yule made his you can drink the stuff speech, I pulled out a can of Killex and a shot glass. I read the labor on the Killex, poured the shot, and I said, put up or shut up. It, the motion carried. He, 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 he shut up. He didn't he, put up. He shut up. That he was couldn't Bob put Yule. up. And uh, North York was the first municipality to at least put up warning signs when they were spraying. Well, in fact, if I recall, and Sheldon, you want to put this one up? Look at the monitor here in the studio. Uh, did they tell you that it would cost 150 bucks a sign to put these up? Yeah, but I happened to be a former art teacher. I had a silk screen shop in my basement. So I went home that night, cut a silk screen, printed off a couple hundred signs, walked into the commissioner's desk in the morning and threw them on his desk and said, these cost me 15 cents each. I bet they love it when you, you show them up like that. Oh, yeah. Not too much. You had, I have to say, because I, I was a city hall reporter about 36, 37 years ago, and had the pleasure of having a front row seat to some of the best fights in politics ever between you and Mel Lastman, who was then first the mayor of North York, then eventually the mayor of Toronto. Why did you two fight so much? You know, first of all, I had an instant dislike for each other because he was a stereotype that I'd been trying to live down most of my life, you know, a fast-talking hustler. Hmm. Um, secondly, it was an act of fate. The Toronto Star established a, uh, as an experiment, a local news, half, half a page a week of local news. And that became so popular, it grew into two full pages a day. So they had an actual bureau in North York full of reporters who had to have stories. Uh, and uh, every day somebody would come into my office and say, have you got a story? And I always had one or two in my back pocket. When there was no story, the bureau chief uh, used to pop his head in my office and say, uh, do you know what Lassman said to you, called you? He called you a blankety blank blank. What's your response? And then he'd go back into Lassman and get Lassman's response to my response, and he had a story. So a, a theme grew up in North York of Moscow versus Lassman, 
uh, that was larger than life simply because the Toronto Star needed to fill two pages of news. Did you two genuinely dislike each other, or was a lot of that just for the cameras? Some of it was for the cameras, but there was a, there was a lot of dislike there. <laughs> Your wife bought his toupee. What was yeah, that about? This is my prized possession, okay? Uh, they, they were selling... Lastman had... I used to be feel sorry for him because he was having these terrible headaches until they learned they were hair aches. So he was getting plugs of hair planted <laughs> into... I don't know where they got the plugs from, okay? But there's no truth to the rumor that, that when he saw a pretty girl go by, his head went to a point. Uh, but nevertheless, she bought this at an auction for, I think, $32, the best $32 investment I ever made. So I would start off by coming into the council chamber, opening my briefcase, taking out the rug and dusting off my chair, and it would just drive them, <laughs> drive them up a wall. And I became a media star, pictures in all the newspapers, all the television shows, and so on. In fact, I, I said, you can't become mayor of North York unless you own this. Now, I tried to donate the thing to the uh, City of Toronto Archives, but they couldn't take it because they couldn't take three-dimensional objects. If it had been Flat Stanley's wig, they would have grabbed it. No problem. The, Mel Lastman managed to get North York called the city with heart. And we have a shot of you actually here. Uh, I guess you weren't too fond of that expression? It was a terrible mistake. How come? Um, because everyone who came to petition North York about something they didn't like would throw it on our faces. Ah. Okay. And, and, uh, and the truth was that Toronto, North York really didn't have much heart. Uh, it had uh, the, the poorest social services in all of Ontario. Uh, and there's a labor, the, the, there was a report, the Social Planning Council released a report uh, that devastated, uh, or showed what devastating poor services we had in North York. Uh, and that became an, uh, a real issue. I mean, trying to build up social services in North York for a, an immigrant population that was landing there with no support. So when I was a kid, I had the North York, the, uh, uh, the uh, I, there were two. There were two community houses down downtown that served those needs. We had nothing like it in North huh. York. University Settlement House. University Settlement House. At one point, North York twinned with a city in Poland called Rotslav, and you had some of the cities and mo mothers and fathers from Rotslav come to North York for a visit, and apparently you took them to see one of the popular sites, which is Black Creek Pioneer Village. Yeah. What do you think? I, I, well, I, I ended up as the host for this, this Polish delegation uh, because, number one, the guys who had gone to Poland before I didn't want to bother, but my assist assistant spoke fluent Polish. So when you take people to tour North York, what is there to see? Maybe the Science Center, maybe Yorkdale Mall. There's not much left. So our final visit was to uh, Pine Black Creek Pioneer Village. And after walking around for a while, I turned to the Vajavoda, the mayor, and said, so what do you think of our Pioneer Village? He says, it's nice, but we have a thousand just like it in Poland. <laughs> and I know my, my grandmother came from one of those little villages. So you know he's telling the truth. Yes. There is a part of your book where you talk a lot about municipal corruption. One uh, of your fellow councillors was sentenced to two years in jail for bribery. A former planning commissioner was fired for taking a loan from a developer. How pervasive was, in fact, corruption at City Hall? North York had some of the best politicians money could buy. Hmm. Uh, fact is, I have a theory. Anything with the word York in it uh, has got a lot of corruption, right from the township of York, uh, where several members went to jail. In North York, there were, there were two, the, two councillors I know who went to jail. One was thrown off for conflict, uh, Council for Conflict of Interest. Um, yeah, but you know what? Most municipal politicians are honest people who are there to better their community. But unfortunately, there are some there uh, who are out for their own good. East York has got York in the title, and it's a very sweet place, don't you think? E yeah, East York is a nice place. They'd be the exception. Yeah, they don't, they, yeah, they don't even have pinball parlors. <laughs> Here's a quote from the book. If you want to get anything done in politics, you have to develop a healthy disrespect for authority. If you want real change, the normal channels don't usually work. Why not? Um, because when you get locked into a job like this, everyone wants to conform to the norm. Uh, and I am the kind of person who, who, when I see something, even a little irritant, I have to fix it. Do you know why you chafed at authority so much? Well, maybe it was my relationship with my father. He trained me for politics. We used to argue at every meal. Hmm. So arbitrary authority used to drive you nuts. Used to drive me nuts. And still does, probably. George Bush, the father, 
was invited to come to the Rogers Center, then called the Sky Dome, to throw out the first pitch at a ball game. You wrote him a letter, Mr. Moscow. What did you tell him to do? Yeah, I, I suggested that uh, respectfully he ought to stay home and I would buy him a case of beer and some pretzels and he can enjoy the game at home. Now, why would you not want to have the President of the United States here? Well, it was at the time when, when we were in a budget disaster. We were, the food banks did, we had lines, line, people lined up. We, or we were talking about closing our, some of our social service, services in North York. And it cost us sixty thousand dollars in overtime, police overtime, to accommodate his visit. Uh, most people don't know this, but they closed, uh, in this case, Highway 4, 427 and the Gardner Expressway, so he can get into town unimpeded. Hmm. Now imagine, uh, and then the police gave advice: try and get home early. Well, imagine me going to my boss and saying, "Excuse me, sir, but I have to leave early today because George Bush is coming to watch a ball game." Did you hear back from him? He never wrote back. He was very wise, and I never did that. But I heard from every newspaper in the United States. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, I, I, I told the Los Angeles Times, if he wants to sneak into town wearing a fake nose and glasses, I'll be happy to buy him a hot dog at the game. Uh, but he did come to the game, and he did throw a nice he first pitch. He came to the game. That was it was the, the labeled the hot dog summit, uh, and they sang Irish eyes are smiling. He and Mulroney, and it was a great game. Gotcha. You don't exactly pull your punches in this book. I want to read another passage here. I never liked former Toronto City Councillor Tom Jakobek. I considered him the most despicable municipal politician I have ever known. That is really quite something to put in print. How come? Um, because he was despicable. Why? He was a bully. Uh, and he stopped at nothing to achieve his objectives and walked over many, many people. And, uh, by the way, I, I don't really badmouth him. I leave that to Madam Justice uh, uh, or uh, the, the, the judge who did the inquiry into, uh, into the uh, computer leasing scandal in Toronto. And Madam Justice Bellamy, I think. Bellamy, that's, that's right. And I, and I simply quoted her. Uh, so I, I didn't just commit anything libelous. Uh, in fact, she agreed he was despicable. Have you heard from him since you wrote the book? No. Do you ever hear from him anymore? Uh, thankfully, no. <laughs> you do love a good scrap. And I don't know if you remember this, but I think it was 21 years ago you were in this studio doing a program here we used to do called Fourth Reading, and you were debating a conservative member of the legislature named Steve Gilchrist. You want to see some of that? Yeah. We got it. Sheldon, clip, please. With us to talk about that, here's one of Toronto's most vocal megacity councillors, a veteran of many bruising fights with the provincial Tories, Howard Moscow, who represents North York Spadina. We always rise to our feet when Premier Harris walks into the room because it's hard to sit down when you're getting an enema. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, you, think, you think about what, he, what they've done to Toronto. First of all, they've slapped a higher education tax on Toronto than anywhere else in the province. They were supposed to even this out. They promised to even it out. But our businesses are going to pay through the nose uh, and the money's going to be siphoned off and just redistributed around the province. Equal okay, time. I oh, thought you ahead. wanted brief opening comments. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, well, sorry, I, uh, I'm only warmed up. Okay. Well, well, well I'm prepared well, to sit back maybe, and let maybe, you defend. Maybe we'll cool you down with some facts. We'll here. let you defend an indefensible position. There's something about Tories that gets you going, eh? What is it? Um, what's their philosophy? Mind you, personally, I, I have some very good friends who are Tories. So, okay. Names so it's, too. It's, it's a, uh, Dennis Kimbrell and I were, were, were good friends. Okay, he was a member of Bill Davis's uh, cabinet. We both taught together at Don Mills Junior High. I did his first sign campaign. No kidding. Yeah. When you say you did it, you, you were in the sign business. Uh, yes, so that's right. So you printed Dennis Timbrell's signs. That's, I designed them. So clearly uh, business is more important than ideology at a certain point. No, 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 no. Dennis and I were friends. Oh, okay. We, okay. Worked, we worked together. And Dennis Timbrell was what you might call a nice red Tory. Have you got any real small-c conservative friends? Um, yeah. I, I, well, many, but the names you wouldn't <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. Here's another story. Oh, boy, did this one get you into trouble. And I think, uh, well, this person is still on city council. You got into a debate with Frances Nunziata, who urged you to come to her ward and walk the streets to see for yourself how poor the Toronto Transit Commission service was. What did you say back to her when she made that invitation? Well, the devil made me do it, but uh, I said, that no, Frances, I'll leave walking the streets to you. Oh, it wasn't intended to be a sexist remark. It just, just happened. Did, did you know as soon as the words came out of your mouth that it was going to get you in trouble? The moment they came The out. moment they came out, but you couldn't help yourself. You did apologize. Oh, pr profusely. I, I stood up immediately and I said, I, 
I apologize. My mouth gets ahead of my brain sometimes. Sometimes? Sometimes. Yeah, okay. Can we talk about your health a bit? Because your health, you talk about this in the book, your health has been a problem during parts of your political career. And I'd like you to tell us the story of how in 2003, you deceived the Toronto Star by seeming to campaign when in fact, I think you were in the hospital darn near the whole campaign. Yeah, I got I had constrictive pericarditis, which I had picked up in Spain, as a virus that attacks the lining around your heart, which begins to harden like cement. Only mine came on really, really quickly. Uh, so they rushed me off to Mount Sinai, and I was in Mount Sinai for about maybe five or six months off and on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew that if, if people found out the election was coming up, if people found out I was ill, they would, I'd have a heavy-duty opponent. Mm -hmm. So a cone of silence fell around my office. We, uh, we pretended I was still in office. I could go to meetings and act as if I were normal. Um, but from a hospital bed, I did all my interviews by, by phone. Uh, I did my emails by phone or by dictation. Conference called all my phone calls. And I was, in all intents and purposes, still in office. And how about when the star wanted a picture of you? Well, that was difficult. The Toronto mm -hmm. Star, you're the, you're the senior counselor. We want a picture of you canvassing uh, uh, in your ward. And I said, well, you got stock photos, use them. No, no, no. So I conferred with my doctor and um, they drove me up to Eglinton Avenue, put on a suit, went into the barber shops and uh, shook hands and talked to people. The star photographer snapped a bunch of photos and then they zipped it back, back to my hospital bed. I, had to, I was vice president of the Association of Municipalities and I had to, I had to show up at their annual meeting, which is in, in August every year, mm. at the Royal York Hotel. So each morning I would get dressed, uh, go down to the Royal York, walk around, talk to a few people, shake a few hands, make a couple of speeches, and zip back to my hospital bed. In fact, Sue Ann Levy at the Toronto Sun used to uh, write a column criticizing me for getting a hotel room at the Royal York, uh, an expensive in-town hotel room, and I didn't disappoint her. I got the hotel room, I knew I would never use it. Well, one of the counselors, Suzanne Hall, came to me and said, gee, I'm tired. I, I don't feel like going back to Rexdale tonight. I said, I have a meeting in my ward. Use my hotel room. And so she used the bed. The next night, Baz Belka soon did the same thing. And when Suzanne interviewed me, I said, well, Suzanne, we saved the city money this time. Three of us shared the bed. <laughs> Do you feel a little bit bad about deceiving the viewers, as to, uh, the voters, rather, as to your condition? No, I don't feel the slightest bit bad because I had my operation. They removed the lining around my heart, and I was back into politics. As good as new. You retired in 2010, which is the year Rob Ford became the mayor. And I wonder if you had it to do it again, would you have wanted to hang around one more term just so you could have crossed oh, swords with him? Oh, yes. Just like I hanker, hang, hanker to be in the, the uh, American Senate right now, <laughs> I'd have the time of my life. Hmm. Uh, and... and uh, I mean, I knew Rob. He, I served on council with him 10 years. And uh, to be there with he as mayor, I would have uh, I haven't written three books now. <laughs> what is the secret to your wife, Gloria's, putting up with you lo these many years? Oh, you have to, you have to ask her. She's a very patient, uh, loving person. Clearly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I, well, I, I was going to say I shouldn't tell tales out of school here, but... What the heck? I mean, your next birthday is going to be your 80th. Yeah. And I wonder if, that if Gloria lets you, that is. If I live that long. <laughs> um, how about I just ask a nice, simple fa final question? How do you feel about life at age almost 80? Uh, I'm completely engaged in my life. I, I have I've become uh, really excellent to do the Toronto Star Daily crossword puzzle. <laughs> I'm bored. I'm bored. <laughs> Sometimes when I watch city council meetings, I think I know what Howard Moscow would say if he were here right now. Yeah, I try very hard not to watch council uh, meetings because they don't want to affect my health. You want to keep the blood pressure yeah, low. Yeah, I keep it low. Got it. Well, I got to tell you, the book was was it was as advertised—a madcap romp through city hall, very nostalgic for a former Toronto city hall reporter. I must well, say. Well, I hope everyone who's watching goes out and buy it. You can buy it at Spacing's Bookstore on, uh, on Kensington Market, uh, or you can just. Google me and you'll get my publisher and he'll send it to you directly or buy it on Amazon. Get those plugs in. It's called <laughs> Call Me Pisher and it's brought Howard Moscow to our studio tonight. Thanks, Howard. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. 
Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.